Good, good. Afternoon, everybody. Hi, it's uh, Richard Warnford here. Um, thank you very much for joining us uh, this afternoon. So um, hopefully I know most people, but I'm Wastewater Director. I've taken a bit of a lead on things on the environmental side of the things in the business, along with Louise, who sort of formally heads up on that. We're here to talk today. Our sponsor for the Enviro Warrior Bubble, really important bubble of things that we did at the Innovation Festival. Um, we'll talk about why in, in just a second. So we're going to give you a bit of an update as part of an encore, if you like, a bit of a follow up. So you see it's something we'll call an encore. We've already had a couple of sessions. Um, Water Wonders and Customer Heroes have already been held. You guys have clearly stepped forward and joined the Enviro Warriors one. So thank you for, for doing that on a Friday. Um, a huge interest isn't there in the water sector at the moment and the environment so so i think we we all see this anybody who's been to any of our road shows have seen this mentioned recently we've talked quite a bit about it and why that is and how important that is to us and we're, we're quite unique aren't we as a sector because we we both take a raw product from the environment and then we rely upon it at the end of the processes particularly the wastewater treatment processes but also water we feel like we discharge back to the environment. So it's quite a unique part of the business and, and what we do. So really important to us. Um, hence the reason I think it's a, a really critical bubble. So the Innovation Festival, many of you might have um, have taken part in that and um, fantastic festival. We might talk about more about this as we go through, but we had over 2000 people took part from 33 countries, 38 sectors. So, you know, a fantastic, again, event um, that we've had, we've held. This on course to sort of keep it going, keep everybody interested, keep you all enthused, get your support for the, the work the guys are doing on, on all of this. So not much more to say from my perspective at the beginning, other than just, you know, you've got some great things we're going to hear about today. We're going to hear about Project Green Screenscape. We're going to hear about next level nature based solutions and we're going to hear about Big River. So um, at that point, I don't want to take up any time for the, uh, from the presenters. I'm going to hand over to Angela, who will probably say a bit more and then introduce the presenters today. All I will say um, is please take part in it. It's always better if we get good input from you guys. So use the chat function, give us your questions, um, engage in the, in the process. And that's the way it'll, um, it'll, be, it'll be the best. So Angela, if I hand over to you, I think you might want to bring Graham in. Hi, afternoon, everybody. Uh, great to be here on the Enviro Warrior session. Uh, and as Richard said, this is a, a really vibrant space for innovation and has been uh, over many, many festivals now. So I'm going to uh, have a have a bit of a jog through history. Uh, but first of all, I'm going to hand over to Graham Southall, who's going to give his perspective on our Enviro Warrior bubble. Thanks, Angela. Uh, thanks, thanks, Richard. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and I guess, I mean, it's Richard's said a fair bit about it. Um, I mean, in my role within the organisation, I'm sure many of you would know, I'm uh, the commercial director, but that also includes our energy activities and in particular, you know, our, our, our drive towards being uh, net zero. I'm not, never get bored of saying it, you know, with we've got the, the strongest commitment of anybody to be carbon neutral by 20, uh, 2027. Um, I think the the important thing for me, there's there's two bits that are really, really important. Firstly, innovation generally. Um, you know, we are a regulated business. We can't do new things. We just need to learn to do what we do in different ways, innovative ways, uh, and make strides that way. And secondly, and Richard said this, but I will repeat it, you know, we are an environmental business. You know, we yes, we are a business. We could focus on the treating of water and, and providing water to our customers or wastewater, but it is all about abstracting water from the environment, treating water, uh, uh, passing it onto our customers, collecting it back, and treating it again with the final waste going back into the environment. We are far more of an environmental business than the many other businesses out there. So, looking at doing things better in that environment bubble if you like in that environment of space is really important and critical to us as a business so and it's also a very broad area with lots of different dimensions looking at native nature-based solutions through to you know new carbon avoidance techniques whatever it might be so so it's a great exciting piece 
Um, and you know, let's let's see where we are this afternoon. And it's great to have this momentum following on from the uh, Innovation Festival. So I'll hand back to to Angela, and she can guide us through uh, the the topics this afternoon. Thanks. Thanks, Graham. So as I mentioned, we've had a really, really rich uh, history of uh, working in this space over the past uh, six festivals. And currently in our innovation pipeline in this space, we have 36 live projects, which are potentially worth over £56 million annually to our business. And I do say potentially because it, we, if we knew all of the answers, it would be definitely. So we are always trying new and different ways in which we can do things, which I think is the real ethos of, of the festival and, and why that works for us. So if I look a little bit back at the track record from the festival, uh, in 2021, uh, we worked on a sprint with Jacobs, looking at how we can promote collaboration to really enable the delivery of wider environmental benefits through the creation of a portal. And this particular project idea is actually now being worked as a potential suggestion through the um, Uqueer route and is being supported to get to the, um, the more detailed project proposal stage. So that'd be really exciting to have that uptake by uh, a bigger body of organisation who can really see how we can make that one come to life. In our 2017, so our very first innovation festival, we actually started working with a business called Storm Harvester. Uh, the work that we've been doing with them, which when we make big changes to our business does take time to, to percolate and to, to really do the right level of rigour and investigation of any uh, new methods or, um, or procedures. And we are now working with them and actually have installed um, their system to actually look at wet weather blockage detection. And what is what we're seeing is actually exceeding our expectation, even in the short time that it's been installed. So we're really excited about the work that we've done with Storm Harvester. And, and really the, fe the festival is a, is a great way in which we can get to see new businesses, new ideas to really change up how we do business uh, at Northumbrian. We've also seen um, a number of novel uh, devices and ideas uh, coming out of the festival and we've done a, a number of different projects uh, with Andrew Turner Innovations and we're looking at so a really exciting one torpedo which is looking at um, a few different um, devices that could go into sewers and act as a little bit of a, of a swarm that can then transmit information about the, uh, the sewer health. We've also been looking uh, at a hydrocells project at how we can actually gather uh, storm water and, and rainwater in meaningful ways and actually interact with the capture and release of that so we can actually better manage the amount of uh, water in our systems. We've also been looking at some very novel sewer flooding devices and also modifications to how we do uh, the CCTV uh, analysis. And all of these pieces of work are in flight. We've won some uh, funding for those. Uh, one of these was with um, the uh, Digital Catapult. Uh, so it's great when we're working with new and different companies to actually uh, look in this very uh, challenging space. If I also switch our gaze a little bit to the success that we've had with the Off What Innovation Fund, uh, we've managed to secure over £500,000 for two projects in this space, one working with organics looking at ammonia recovery and we're looking to do some work at our Howden plant with them and that work is well underway and we managed to secure that funding back in the first round of the competition. Uh, we also in the uh, in the catalyst round last year managed to secure funding working uh, on an aspect of our microalgae project uh, with Northumbria University and Newcastle University looking at a novel substrate for this microalgae to uh, capture and uh, and capture phosphorus and create a more circular economy for that. So two uh, very, very exciting uh, projects that are underway that we're delighted that we managed to secure funding for. And keeping with the microalgae theme, um, we've been working with the, with Matt Pickersgill and the team at Brand Sands to actually secure uh, InvestQuest funding, uh, also for an aspect uh, of the microalgae to actually create a pilot plant at Brand Sands. And this is a really big and ambitious project that uh, that will really disrupt uh, how we uh, how we treat uh, the sludge and how we uh, remove phosphorus. So we're really excited by what can come with that. 
And then also in, in 2020, the um, the wastewater team also managed to secure uh, the InvestQuest win, looking at how, what we can do along nature based solutions. So we're really committed to working in this space, have, uh, as I said, a great pipeline of projects in there that are really starting to come to fruition. And I just want to flag up front that the whole point of these on-call sessions is to share what comes out of the Innovation Festival. And unfortunately, we have not got an update on our rat out hack that kind of sat within this bubble. So just in case you're wondering uh, why that one's not being covered, um, it's just because this project is not being uh, being continued really with us leading, with Northumbrian leading, but it is actually still moving along with the partners that were part of that particular hack. And they've actually been uh, creating a virtual coll collaborative environment for data capture and sharing in this uh, very interesting space. So work is still continuing in, in that rat out uh, space, which we will continue to keep you updated on. But what we're going to do be doing now is we're going to be focusing on the projects that actually were at the festival in 2022. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Clive Sermon Wells, who will be sharing more about the Greenscape project. Over to you, Clive. Thanks very much, Angela. Um, so this uh, is actually Project Greenscape. It's an initiative that we had lots of ideas about before the festival, and we used the Innovation Festival to bring together a whole group of really interested parties um, from all fields, particularly farming, because it's really a project about farming. So we're, we're really exploring how can we improve river water quality through the adoption of regenerative agricultural practices on farms in our catchments. And the catchment is the area of the river that we abstract water from to, to process it. So the quality of incoming water is really important to us, uh, as are the health of our rivers. We should get this term regenerative agriculture out of the way as well, just so you know what I'm talking about here. So this is a, a series of um, uh, a collection of pr um, practices that are done on farms and they range from maintaining a living root in the soil, minimizing soil disturbance because that can cause uh, soil to run off into the river causing uh, turbidity and discoloration, but also particles of soil carry with them nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, and other um, fertilizers uh, and products into the water that will contaminate the water and very difficult and very expensive to remove further downstream. So it's about protecting the soil sur sur uh, surface by having a diversity of crops and integrating livestock with them. So that's, that's in a nutshell what it is. But looking at the rivers as well, um, water quality results released by the Environment Agency in 2020 showed that only 15% of England's rivers reached a good ecological status and runoff from agricultural land can contribute to poor water, river quality. Uh, and it's estimated that around 60% of the nitrate pollution and 25% of phosphorus in water bodies is, is estimated to come from agriculture. So working on this with farmers, and we had six farmers in the tent with us on the first day at the Innovation Festival, we've come up with a project and a practice that we think uh, we can apply to improve river water quality. Historically, we're not great. At, I mean, the, the country isn't great at measuring river water quality. It's quite an involved process and involves uh, sampling and and monitoring the river is very, very expensive to do with all sorts of instrumentation. So we've had a close look at how we can do that. And we've hatched a project, which is a five year project. At the, at the, this was developed at the, the approach was developed at the festival itself. Um, to take six catchments and six stretches of river and to work with all of the farmers in that catchment to see how we can adopt these regenerative agricultural practices. Now, it's a change that we want farmers to make and we want to support farmers to make. Um, for, for a number of years, many water companies have been doing lots of work in this field. Um, but measuring the impact of those changes hasn't been so forthcoming. So what we're proposing is a pro an approach where we go on to the farm we we have a conversation with the farm about the history of the farm and it's and it's um the type of agriculture that's practiced 
their use of different kinds of fertilizers, their use of water, their history of flooding on the on the um, on the farm, uh, and their appetite for regenerative agricultural practices, and their appetite for credit schemes. So farmers can be paid, or landowners can be paid um, for things known as carbon credits, nutrient nutrient neutrality credits, and biodiversity credits. And there's opportunities to create these that could give the farmer a source of income that can help bridge the gap as they make the changes from the traditional techniques across to more sustainable agricultural practices. So we we would carry out that and at the same time we'd send out scientists to the field to sample the soil and uh, to look at the quality, the carbon content and the organic content of the soil at the outset as a benchmark and the same in the river. So we would put sensors in the river upstream and in the section of river we're monitoring and tie all of those three things together to take a benchmark then discuss opportunities with the farmer for uptake of some new practices and then over the five years it's a long-term project actually 30 years we, we would intend for the project to run over the uh, a whole after the five-year funded phase to keep going through uh, our other sources of income which i'll come on to 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 measure the difference that those practices are making, not only to the river, but to the soil as well. Uh, it's really important to point out that improving uh, organic and carbon content in the soil means that soil sequesters more carbon. So it's helping us, uh, helping the environment. It also, uh, soil with a high carbon content is known to hold more moisture. So it's actually a drought resilience measure and uh, an anti-flooding measure as well if the soil can hold more water. So, uh, so that's our approach in general, but one of the most innovative parts of it is the way that we intend to measure. If we wanted to scale this project up uh, to, to the whole country, then it would simply wouldn't be affordable because the measurement process would be so expensive. And that's where the innovators came in. And we had sponsors, the sponsors of our sprint were IBM, the RSK Group, and Vintelligence, and they, each of those and a group of other people we've been working with since have come up with alternative methods of measuring the soil carbon content, organic content, the biodiversity, the current biodiversity and river water quality using a whole load of other techniques that aren't so expensive and that if we combine these technologies in different ways, in different catchments, we can work out what the optimum combination of those new technologies, those emerging technologies is to give us the same answer as these expensive technologies but for less money and hopefully quicker and, and perhaps in a more diverse way as well because if you think about river water quality sampling it usually involves somebody scrambling through brambles to get to a very very difficult to get to place to take a water sample that's just telling you what the water quality is like at that particular point so what we're trying to do by doing it uh, remotely is enable anybody to do that and to provide ourselves with um, information all the time rather than just at those sample points. So since since the project we've been engaging with uh, uh, most of the water companies and we have actually got signed up partnership to this project from uh, seven or eight different water companies around the country, from the Environment Agency and the Rivers Trust, um, from three universities because our project involves some research, so Newcastle, Lancaster and the University of East Anglia, a local authority, Durham County Council, have signed up because they're really interested in the, how the credits market will work. And then some technology providers, Vintelligence, who offer a product for ground-based capturing of video that we've used in other applications uh, in the water industry, but not for this particular application. Downforce Technologies, who are specialist in uh, satellite imagery and satellite technology. Also, the, um, the uh, satellite application Catapult, and a couple of other um, technology companies. And we, we, we're also talking to Natural, Natural England and DEFRA. And the purpose, I mean, I'm, I'm nearly finished now, the purpose of this sort of large consortium of partners is to put forward a bid to the off what innovation competition. And that is what we did. The entries closed on Wednesday. We put forward an £8.7 million bid to run this project with those partners. We'll find out whether we're successful in that bid in December. Um, and in the meantime, we'll be continuing to work up the precise details of the project. It's already uh, a well-developed project and it's had lots of input from people around our business and from all of those organisations into 
you know, exactly how we should run that project, how much it will cost, which technologies we should use and so forth. So that's pretty well the where where we've got to uh, with Project Greenscape. And obviously I'll let you know how we get on in December if we get shortlisted. We could uh, we could have a, a major project on our hands that would go it's go nationwide. It's a national project. Uh, that's, that's it from me, Angela. Thank you very much, Clive. That sounds like you've had uh, a hugely busy time since the festival. So incredible that in that very short time you've managed to pull together such a gigantic consortia and put together uh, a uh, a well considered bid in really quite a different, diff like a really difficult, challenging space. So, what do you think was the most challenging part of of, of your of this particular project? Um. Well, I suppose that the notion that it's a change we're asking farmers to make, we're not making the change. If, if, if it was the water companies that had to make the change, it would be very, very straightforward and probably an easy sell. But it's a completely different industry and group of people who we're asking to make the change. So having a really compelling case um, to, to make that happen and people who can influence them, our own catchment advisors, for instance, will be really instrumental in this and the uh, Natural England and EA's catchment sensitive farming advisors, you know, winning those people over, which I, I might add we have done. So, so Natural England are now engaged. Um, we've started this discussion. So it's having all of those discussions and getting the right people involved to win farmers over uh, and to work in partnership with farmers. That, that, that's going to be really challenging, I think, as we go forward too. Well, fingers crossed, and I very much hope that uh, that we get through to the uh, the second stage with that particular bid. Uh, so, uh, so we'll find out, and we'll keep everybody posted uh, in terms of what happens with that. So, uh, so great, great work, Clive, and indeed the uh, the Project Greenscape team. So now we're going to switch gears, and we're going to go over and hear more about the Big River Hack. And I'm going to hand over to Michael Porritt, who will be telling us more about that. Over to you, Michael. Thank you. I wish I'd gone first now. It's a tough act to follow that one. Well done, Clive. Um, hi, everyone. So, yeah, this year I led the uh, Big River Data Hack, um, which was all about finding a way that we can publish information on spills from storm overflows in near real time um, and enhancing that information with um, and combining it with rich contextual data. Um, as a bit of background, the Environment Act 2021 has a requirement that all water companies need to publish this spills data in near real time. Um, near real time might not mean much to you, but um, in this context, it means within an hour. So within an hour of the spill starting, we have to publish that it started. Um, and within an hour of it stopping, we have to publish again to say that it stopped. Um, it also says that the data should be published in a format that's easy to understand um, and should be readily accessible. At Northumbry Mortar, we felt that um, this start and stop information was only part of the picture. Um, so in the true spirit of the Innovation Festival, we wanted to explore going further in our hack. Um, it's important to say that that part of the act hasn't actually been enacted yet, um, so we don't really know the timescales um, that we're going to be given for achieving this. Um, we really want to make sure that we're ahead of the game, though, uh, when it comes to the water environment. Um, so we're committed to a number of pledges that form our vision for um, our coasts and rivers. And one of those pledges is to provide access to near real time spills data via a data portal by the end of next year. Um, when it comes to the, the hack that I led, um, spills from storm overflows is an important topic for everyone at the moment. So I was really pleased to be able to work with the Stream Open Data Group to pull together um, spills data from another number of other water companies um, to be used in the hack along with our own data. Um, it might seem like a pretty straightforward hack topic, but believe me, there's, there was loads of different aspects to it. Um, so we had actually split the, the hack group down into a number of smaller groups with each group looking at a different aspect of the challenge. The first part um, was validation of data. So, um, I don't know if, it, if you know about the, the sewerage network, but a, a big challenge when you're trying to measure anything to do with sewerage is that instrumentation has a, a really hard time of it when it has to live within the sewer because it's quite a, a difficult environment to live in. Um, we often get false readings and communication issues. Um, so validating that data quickly enough 
um, so that we can publish it in real time is going to be um, you know, a huge challenge. So this, the group, the subgroup that we had looking at, I came up with a, some brilliant ideas um, exploring the use of machine learning um, to start auto validating some of that spills data. And their approach was to manually review the spills data uh, as we go to, to keep training that machine learning model so that gradually over time it can reduce the amount of data that needs to be manually, manually reviewed. And hopefully that would lead to us being able to validate quickly enough to then publish in, in near real time. The next group we're looking at um, information for the public, which I guess is really the, the main part of this topic. So once we've validated the data, we then have to, um, we've got the opportunity to share that data uh, with the public in a way that tells the full story um, and allows them to choose what they want to see. This group were actually winners of the hack um, because they came up with an amazing app um, that allowed water users to choose what activity they were going to actually do, um, i.e. swimming or paddle boarding. Um, and then actually look at locations where they were considering going and get up to date river water quality information and other relevant information to allow them to make an informed decision on, on what they were going to do that day. Um, the next group we're looking at using that same data, but how could we actually then uh, use that data in a different way for water companies? Um, and what they came up with was integrating that data into the systems that we use when customers call us to either inquire about uh, river water quality or, or spills or to um, lodge a complaint in some way so that we could give the call handlers the most up to date information to give the customers the best information they can at that point of contact. And then finally, the last group we're looking at um, using the contextual data that I mentioned earlier, which could be rainfall data, river levels, flow levels. Um, can we use all of that information and in assess the likely impact um, that any given spill could have? So rather than just saying something started and stopped at this time, could we say it started and stopped at this time, but the river level was doing this? It had been raining really heavily in the hours beforehand, and therefore the impact is likely to be this, so that you could feed that into um, whoever needs to see that information. And again, they could make a decision um, on what they want to do. Um, overall, I, I guess it was a, it was a brilliant hack, which is, you know the groups worked really well together, and it's it's a really complex topic, um, but we were able to come up with some excellent ideas. It does sound like you had a very fruitful uh, hack uh, in a in a very in a very topical um, area uh, for this particular year, and I particularly like the fact that you um, you're listening to the customer voice in terms of we obviously have lots and lots of information, but actually being able to share that with the public in a way that is meaningful and that they can choose what they want to see, I think will be really impactful and will really make a difference. Um, um, I also think that the uh, that strand around uh, making sure that our call handlers are really well informed should we have incoming, whether that be through uh, the phone or even whether that be through our website. Again, I think keep being open and transparent and keeping people informed, I think will be really meaningful. So, uh, so I really look forward to seeing more in this space. I know that we've got an awful amount of work going on uh, in this particular area, which is, which is great to see. And brilliant to have had that as part of the the innovation festival. So uh, so fantastic to uh, to hear about that. So uh, looking forward to seeing more in this in this space uh, as as we continue. So we were going to have an update from the uh, next level nature solutions. Um, team but uh, but unfortunately uh, we're having some technical difficulties getting the right person hooked in with us today so I'm afraid we'll probably be covering that one in a future encore session or indeed in our Innovate um, Connect uh, newsletter which I'm hoping that you'll all be signed up to so what we can do now is we can uh, we can switch to uh, some of the questions that have come in so I've seen that we've had one there around um, uh, what are the uh, six river catchments? So I'm not sure, Clive, is this something that you can cover? Yeah, 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 definitely. I, what I didn't uh, have time to say was that um, in phase one of the project the, where we have six catchments, two are taken by three different water companies. So we've already partnered with United Utilities and Anglian Water. So the two that Northumbrian Water have chosen are the River Pant, 
and Blackwater, which is in Essex, and the River Brownie in County Durham. So we've got a, a range. Uh, Anglian Water are uh, wanting to use um, Wendling Beck, which was one of the um, uh, test catchments that was used in a previous uh, initiative, and they're looking for an, a, a second one. They haven't named it. We don't. We don't need to name it until the next round, really. United Ut Utilities, likewise, sort of evaluating their options and choosing the right two. You've got to get a mix of where farmers are semi-engaged. We don't want to be hitting a brick wall, but we don't want to pick a catchment where there are no river water problems and no agricultural problems. We need to be able to show a measure and improvement. So the choice of catchment is quite a quite a careful um, activity we need to undertake. Cool, thank you for that. Uh, also, I was wondering whether, again, either for Clive or for, for Michael, what role do you see? Um, do you see any other gaps? The whole area around um, river water quality monitoring is actually really a huge challenge given the environment in which a monitor needs to sit in terms of how we get data. So what innovations do you think that you would like to see to really help us in this particular space? Angela, can I build upon that just a little bit? That question, Go. just and um, just uh, the, you're both talking about monitoring in different ways for different audiences. Do you, do you see that these will be different monitors? They could be the same monitors, just on different scales. Uh, what uh, any thoughts in that space as well? Okay, Michael, do, do you want to go first, or do you want me to? Um, I was good. Yeah, I'll go first. Okay. okay. Yeah, sorry, I, I guess I was just going to say that the, there is a proposed requirement as well to um, increase the, the level of uh, what, river water quality monitoring. It's also another one of our pledges that I mentioned for the uh, coast and rivers. Um, but whilst, whilst there's a requirement, it, it's fair to say that the, there isn't a fixed um, a fixed aspect in terms of how we will actually do that monitoring. So. Um, if you think about how many outfalls we have and, and the fact that we would want to monitor river water quality upstream and downstream at each one of those outfalls, um, that's a monitoring station times two for each one of those outfalls. Um, and you know, on the face of it, that could be a lot of different instrumentation. Um, and um, there's definitely some space there for innovation, I would say, in terms of coming up with new types of monitors and also even around types of installation that would be um, make it secure and safe from tampering while still able to, to sample everything that we need. So it's definitely a space where where we could see some innovation there, I think. I, I would add to that by saying that um, the monitoring of, C of CSOs, in my, in my view, is fairly prescriptive. So um, the rules around how you do that are quite tight. What we're trying to do in Greenscape is come up with some alternatives and show that they work for a different application, but then they could be adopted into this area. If we can show that you can get a comparable accuracy for much less money, but get pretty well the same answer, then, then that's quite a scalable approach to it. So that's one thing. The other thing I would say is um, part of our project is to um, improve the scalability of uh, passive sensors for river water quality monitoring. So Claire Deasy has been involved in some really interesting work with Lancaster University around developing um, a gel patch which can tell you total exposure to phosphorus over a period of time in a river. They work a bit like the sensors you get at um, Sellafield, which will measure exposure to radioactivity over a long period of time. Um, they don't tell you the specifics, you know, which day it occurred on or which hour and minute, but, but it does draw your attention to an area that might have a phosphorus product pr uh, problem, which has been observed over 30 days and then allow you to introduce some more, uh, more uh, granular monitoring to that area. So what we're trying to do in Greenscape is combine these different methods of monitoring in different combinations to, to, to try and see which gives us the best and the most economical answer. I mean, we're not sure any of it will work or all of it will work, but, but you, we're going to try it in enough catchments and in enough different combinations to probably come up with some pretty compelling answers. Clive and Michael, just to keep the discussion going a little bit on monitors then, because you, you at one point there, Clive said, and you're absolutely right, um, and I think Michael said something similar, that it's very prescriptive around what we have to do with storm overflows, but but it doesn't necessarily mean it's right at the moment, right? Just to get some, I think through innovation, we can always try and challenge, if you like, a little bit as well. 
because I think at this point in time, you know, just the very fact of monitoring upstream and downstream, you can have an interesting debate about whether that's worthwhile or whether actually it's better to just monitor downstream and halve the cost of a multi-billion pound programme and check if your rivers are then in the OK condition. And, and then, so there's a little bit about, yes, regulators are telling us what to do, but through these kind of innovations and the ways of thinking, we can maybe challenge some of that. Might yeah. might not be successful, but just really push the boundaries a bit, I think. Yeah, I agree. We we definitely, we are, we are a proponent of upstream monitoring because we need to control so that we can see what difference the agricultural changes have made on the river, as opposed to what the how, what the river was doing in the first place. Um, but it's a really good point that um, these expensive sensors have a really important part to play, e even in Greenscape, where we're looking for cheaper and better ways of doing it, because we need a benchmark against which to monitor. They're considered to be the Rolls-Royce sensors that give you the definitive answer. Um, and we're trying to emulate that with other technologies. Um, but without that benchmark, you know, who's to say whether our, our alternatives are better or worse? Do you think that um, did the use of digital techniques may indeed help us with some data and be able to fill in gaps or infer things like what we've used in other spaces? Well, we're not doing very much river water quality monitoring across the whole. If you look across the whole country, if you counted the number of the length of rivers and the number of sensors that were in the rivers and did, divided one by the other, you'd probably be shocked at how how little monitoring there actually is. What we're trying to do through our project is is come up with an approach, a technique that's affordable and is scalable on a national scale, which transforms the way we monitor rivers and makes it accessible to everybody and it does it will dovetail with projects like united utilities catchment system thinking cooperative which is looking at citizen science and measurement of the river you know by citizens um, and bringing all of that information together to give a good answer well oh, thanks clive i've just seen that we've had uh, another uh, question in so why does the monitoring have to be 50 meters away from the asset for the environmental act is there any danger of interpreting the data i think that's just it, it i think is this in relation to the upstream and downstream monitoring at, at outfalls yeah yes. it, and it just relates so that you're, you're getting an indicative sample of the river rather than um, a sample of what's coming directly out of the outfall. Yeah, I understand the jury's out on that one, and there is some deb debate about how far up and downstream it needs it needs to be. The other the other thing, just to keep um, as much for the people listening in as well, this is it's just this interesting debate that we're having about who the we is in all of this. So I think that if you take greenscapes, it's we're looking at partnerships and things, which I think is brilliant. I think that's where they should be because there is a, a sort of a stealthy move towards. The water companies starting to monitor their river water quality, isn't there? Through all of this, you know that where if we, if that was the water companies, all of a sudden are the ones do. If we're the ones doing the monitoring, then everybody looks to us for river water quality, and we know that actually we're not all of the contribution. So there's just in it, there's lots of interesting discussions going on at the moment about who monitoring would sit with, who it would be owned by, would it be some kind of arm's length body that monitored, and all of that's going on in the background because these. But it's, it's quite a move, you know, that has always been the environment agency's remit and water companies are being asked to step into that space, which is quite interesting. I think you're on, I think you're on mute, Angela. Yeah, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in, so it's um, it's great to uh, to have had an update from uh, from these two projects. Brilliant to see that they are making uh, real strides since July, which actually isn't that far ago, really. So it's um, so I'm sure that we're going to be uh, really keen to see the outcome of the off what uh, innovation bid. So fingers crossed for that one. Uh, and great to see how these uh, projects will progress anyway, which we will keep you up to date with our Innovation Connect newsletter. So please feel free to sign up to that to get all of the latest news. We also have, um, oh, I can see that we actually have got another question in. So let me reread this one. So have you considered high level resolution aerial survey as opposed to satellite, which has lower resolution? 
That one's definitely you, Clive. Yeah. Um, so, so the answer is yes. Um, uh, the difference between air, high resolution aerial um, imagery and satellite imagery is satellites are going around the Earth all the time at a regular interval. So what that allows you to do for not a lot of money is get is get a continuous semi-continuous picture of what's going on uh, on the land uh, whilst aerial imagery can only be really shot at certain times of year in good conditions um, and is costly um, at scale so we kind of ruled it out I mean I, I guess I wouldn't rule it out completely we probably will look into it it's the same question for drones as well um, but but it's it's limited and and what you know if you think about what we're trying to do here it's come up with something that's scalable on a nationwide basis that's affordable so those kind of have a little bit of a red flag against them uh, from that point of view cool i knew that you'd have the answer to that one clive we're actually having a flurry of questions now so we've had one in here from from roger martin asking so on the agricultural project are you also going to monitor the change in agricultural productivity through farm practice changes this would allow the benefits of the, to the environment to be understood in relation to food production great That's question really, that is a really good question and um, I, I guess the answer the answer is um, farmers aren't obliged to do anything we suggest or recommend, even if it's based on a huge amount of information and inf uh, an advice from agronomists and catchment advisors and so forth. Um, but one thing that we have included into the project is an annual review, which not only involves monitoring the soil and the river quality, but a discussion with the farmer about the impact and the changes of the of the um, the agricultural changes. I mean. The person to ask whether whether the productivity has dropped is the farmer because they'll be monitoring it an awful lot more closely than 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 we are but one thing we'll, we will be monitoring is the organic content of the soil its moisture holding capacity and its carbon content as well which is probably something that the farmer won't do routinely but we will be mo monitoring that so I say in, in answer to the question the farmers probably got it covered better than we have but we'll have we're still going to have an annual review and remember after the five-year project we're looking for, for long term government funding or funding from big business to allow this monitoring to go on for the next 25 years after the project. So the evidence base for the benefits of regenerative agriculture and sustainable farming practices is is irrefutable because it's based on so much information. Uh, Cl Clive, if I might just come in, so sorry for being late, but uh, it would be interesting to see if we could get the farmers to share their yields, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we couldn't compel it, but it would be interesting if they did. That's right. We've recognised that, you know, we're gathering a huge amount of data here. So actually good old data sharing agreements and consent yeah. to use data come into the project. We've got a data management package that we've had to introduce to kind of manage that because as a, far, as a farmer, you'll probably ask who's going to see my data? Who's going to be, a, you know, who's going to have access to this information? And there may be some sensitivity, but we've, we kind of got that covered through um, our data package. We've also got a question here about um, when you talk to farmers, uh, when you talk with farmers about biodiversity and or carbon credits, is there any room to allow them to offset their own requirements or is this the funding model based on the uh, on the sale of credits? No, the farming, the, the, the commercial model is not based wholly on credits and it couldn't it couldn't be. Um, because I'm not sure there's enough money in there to cover to cover all the costs and that's why we're looking to people like Natural England, DEFRA and the Environment Agency to supplement the funding particularly long term but one of the premises is uh, and we've worded it I think to say um, creation of, of, of credits to offset other people's activities once the farm is considered to be carbon neutral so farmers priorities will be to get their own house in order and not to sort of bail everybody else out, and out, out uh, through credits, but there's going to be a surplus of credits. And remember, we're not just talking about biodiversity, it's carbon credits, it's nutrient neutrality, and there are other credits emerging all the time that can be stacked up on land. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see how those how those emerge from the project and how much surplus there is and how much of a how much of the gap in funding it's not gap in funding it's just supporting farmers to make those changes it's a big risk to farmers businesses to change agricultural practices they'll be really concerned about loss of productivity and the risk and there's no guarantee for them so you know it's all about convening the various parties to support the farmers to make the change which is good for all 
sounds amazing and great to see a lot of interest on on this really exciting project. So uh, so thanks for that, Clive. Uh, so now I, I would uh, welcome any um, roundup thoughts from either uh, Graham, Richard, or Nigel before we close this session. I, Angela, I just want to say I'm thank you to everybody for joining, and um, really big thank you to Clive and Michael because they've put a huge effort into this, both at the festival and actually in in pushing things along afterwards. So just really good stuff, really important work, and um, and thank you to the the people who've joined us on a Friday afternoon too. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, I just I want to say, could, oh, go on, Graham. Go on, go for it. Yeah. Well, I was going to say I was just building on that. I mean, the um, these these are both two really important areas, and when we look at um, we look at innovation and change, doing things that we know how to do and just doing it better. And if I look at it from a carbon perspective, you know, just learning how to use renewable energy, etc., isn't really the way we're going to make make changes and, and take things forward. Doing things, you know, the whole um, uh, nature-based solutions, doing things differently, very differently. That's how we make make changes. And there's a there's an awful long way to go because it's an awfully long, awfully complicated area. And and you know, some of the points Cloud was making at the end there in terms of some of the various different credits and how they they add together and the whole you know, the whole set of issues. It is complex area, and this is really really important stuff to get us moving forward and get get some learning. So yeah, both of these are really really good exciting areas. Yeah, and I would just add my thanks um, to the presenters and to everybody who showed up. And um, if you do feel like you're interested in those ideas and you want to stay attached to them or you want to indeed contribute to them, then just let us know. Uh, the, we're always looking for people who have a passion for these things to drive them forward. And, and uh, you know, I think we've formed some compelling partnerships outside of our business, but there's also room within our business for people to, to get involved in this. So please feel free to do so and uh, yeah, let's say thanks again and have a good weekend. <laughs>